say thank you for being out here in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, my name is Hector Salamanca. I'm one of the 11 million undocumented immigrants you were referring to. I have deferred action for childhood arrivals, and I've been following your campaign very closely. I know both Erica and Cesar who work on your campaign. And for me personally, I actually came in with a different question, but uh, I, I changed the question because seeing you speak and hearing you speak just reminded me today that my mother is working a 16-hour shift today as I speak in order to take care of my youngest brother. Now, thankfully, her and my dad were able to put me through college so and for myself, so I graduated college without debt, or I graduated without legal status as well, other than DACA. So for my mom, to hear you say that you want to increase the minimum wage to a living wage and that you don't care about your status, but you want everyone to be, have equal access, it really means a lot to me, and I want to say thank you. Just say this, and, and, and thank you, and I'm very proud of your mother and what she has accomplished. Um, you know, the ideas that I talk about, I get criticized sometimes by the Wall Street Journal about this, and they say, well, you know, talk about all these radical ideas, raising the minimum wage to a living wage, and, and making public colleges and universities tuition free, and creating millions of jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. Can we afford all that stuff? And the answer is yes. We can. There is no idea that I have brought forth today that is not being done in other countries already around the world. Right? The idea of a living wage, the idea of ending the absurdity of people working 40, 50 hours a week and falling further and further into debt. Stop and take a flip. Think about it. What sense is it in a competitive global economy when we want the best educated workforce possible, then we are telling young people that to get a college degree, you've got to go deep into debt. That you're going to have to pay off that debt. I saw a guy a couple of weeks ago, a guy's about years, he's more in debt today than he was when he took out that debt. I spoke to a woman in New Hampshire, and I don't want to get you nervous on this. She is not only paying off her own student debt, she's paying off her kids' student debt. Right? What we want to do is have the best educated workforce. That means we want to encourage young people to get all of the education that they can, not burden them with disastrous debt. So that, to me, is kind of a no-brainer. And at a time when we bailed out Wall Street, you remember how we bailed out Wall Street? Well, I think maybe it's time for Wall Street to help us, and that's why I'm going to pay for this. These tuition free, lowering interest rates on student debt through a tax on Wall Street speculation. Okay, my name is Diana Reyes. I am a family support worker at a community health center. Um, community my, health center? Yes. My question to you is, would you allow DACA recipients to receive federal subsidies when purchasing health insurance through the marketplace? Yes. Okay, is that a short, direct answer? The answer is yes. <laughs> do you work at a federally qualified community health center? Yes, I do. All right. Well, one of the <laughs> – uh, I happen to believe in a Medicare for All single-payer program, but I voted and worked on the Affordable Care Act, and one of the reasons I ended up voting for it is we got $12 billion more into community health centers. And as a result of that, some 4 million people. Did you get more money recently, do you know? Have you seen the last few years? Yes. Okay, well, yes. we got that money in to community health centers all over this country. And they do a great job in providing health care, dental care. Do you have dental care? Yes, we do. Mental health counseling? Yes, we do. Low-cost prescription drugs? Yes. All right. 
That's what we're fighting for. And I was glad to get $12 billion at the community health centers all over this country. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Bernie, we just came from the presidential forum. You did great over there. We Thank really you. like that. But we were actually just kind of wondering, talking about it. Um, one of my friends had a real question about, do you oppose the trillion dollar nuclear arms um, policy proposal that the Obama administration yes. is trying to put forth? Um, yes, I do. Um, obviously, we need a strong defense. But the truth is there is enormous waste within the $600 billion a year Defense Department. Uh, it turns out that the Department of Defense is the only major government agency which cannot sustain an independent audit. So I think there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of cost overrun. We are right now maintaining, I think, I won't swear to you, I think it's 5,000 nuclear weapons. Got that? Now, I don't know what the world looks like at the end of 2,000 nuclear weapons going off. I don't know that you need another 3,000. Uh, but, yeah, I do oppose that. It's, it's a heck of a, I mean, just think about it now. A trillion dollars probably, what, over a 10-year period? 30 years period. All right, so it's $30 billion a year. You know what we could do for education? with $30 billion a year. You know what we could do with nutrition? You know what we could do with affordable housing? I think it's a lot higher priorities than maintaining uh, that type of nuclear arsenal. Welcome, Senator Sanders. Um, today we're at uh, American Legion Hall. Uh, honor the many Latino veterans who've served in the military. Uh, I served four years in the U.S. Navy. Uh, back in the 70s. Uh, my uncle Frank Enriquez, he served in Iwo Jima as a Marine during World War II. Uh, and I know several veterans here today that attended this roundtable. What will you do for veterans? Well, thank you very much for your service to our country. Uh, and I speak to you as somebody who knows a little bit about the issue because I've been a member of the Veterans Committee for many years and am the former chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. No longer the chairman, but I was for two years. Number one, I think that we all have a moral obligation to make certain that we do everything that we can to protect in terms of health care and earn benefits the men and women who put their lives on the line to defend this country. So you will see me and have seen me already in the forefront of preventing any cuts to benefits for disabled veterans or veterans at all. That's number one. That's my record already. Number two, as chairman, I work with the American Legion, and I work with the VFW and the DAV and the Vietnam Vets uh, and all of the veterans' organization on the most comprehensive veterans' legislation brought forth in the modern history of the United States. That's what the VFW called it. And what that would have done is made it easier for veterans to get into the VA, made it easier. It would have significantly improved health care for veterans who are into the VA, would have expanded benefits to include dental care, which does not exist right now. It's a very important issue for many veterans. And alternative forms of treatment dealing with pain relief rather than just over-medication. We also provided educational opportunity for Gold Star mothers. We made it easier for families to take advantage of the post-9-11 GI Bill. Bottom line is, I believe the people who put their lives on the line to defend this country deserve the highest quality health care possible, which means that we have the strongest VA system. And number two, they deserve to get their benefits in a timely manner. All right. Now, I, in terms of my comprehensive legislation, I needed 60 votes on the floor of the Senate. I only got two Republicans and all the Democrats, 56. I didn't succeed. So I had to go back to the drawing board and work with people like John McCain and some of the other Republicans on a scaled-down bill. But we ended up with a $17 billion piece of legislation, which will strengthen the VA, which will make certain that veterans get care in the VA in a timely manner, which will make certain that if veterans do not live near a VA facility, they can go to a private physician to get the care they need. So bottom line is, I believe that we have a moral obligation to make certain that we provide 
all of the benefits that our veterans deserve, and I will fight to make that happen. Hi, Senator Sanders. My name is Anna, and I live here in Des Moines. And uh, my question to you is that there are people like Donald Trump that are spreading hateful comments about Latinos and other minorities. What would you do to help Latinos integrate into our American society and our communities and fight this hateful rhetoric? You know, in a democracy, people are entitled to have different points of view on any issues. And people can disagree on immigration reform. But what is not acceptable is for demagogues to be resorting to racism and bigotry and xenophobia. I think Trump's remarks that people coming in from Mexico are criminals and rapists and drug dealers is an outrage and has got to be confronted every step of the way. I am doing it and I will do that. Once again, you know, this country has struggled for hundreds of years with racism. We've struggled with the way we treated Native Americans. We've struggled with slavery. We've struggled with the Asian Expul Chinese Expulsion Act. We've struggled with discrimination against Italians and Irish and Jews and Catholics and everybody else. That's been the history of the United States. This is the year 2016. And I would have hoped that we have reached the level that that type of overt racism and scapegoating was behind us. And what upsets me very much is that what Trump has done through his rhetoric, not only against Latinos, but against Muslims as well, is open that door for that latent racism which exists to now come out and people being bolder about expressing their ugly ideas. Our job is to shut that door firmly. So you're looking at somebody who, if elected president, will do everything he can to combat institutional racism and bigotry uh, at all levels. And in terms of making it easier for people uh, to become part of the American culture, I think we need to invest in schools and community centers where people, when they have the time after work, can learn English and can learn other aspects about fitting into American society. So I believe that very strongly. Yeah. Hi, Senator Sanders. My name is Vanessa Marcano Kelly. Um, I've been following your campaign very closely, especially uh, the issue of immigration and workers' rights and how that ties, there is very linked uh, very closely together. Um, I came here with a student visa, and I also had uh, a guest worker visa, so-called skilled guest worker, and then there's seasonal guest workers, and now I'm a permanent resident. So in my work, I used to be a community organizer, and I used to work with uh, a lot of undocumented workers, but also young workers, just different types of workers. And what really worried me is the deterioration of the future of work that there's practices that are happening across industries, across the country, irresponsible subcontracting practices, systematic wage theft, um, on-call scheduling. With the guest worker programs or with, just in general? In general and with the guest worker programs. That is also being used as a way to yes. exploit workers further. Um, but but it's, it's everyone, and it's the very nature of work that is changing. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about um, what would you do in order to, to fight back against this deterioration of, of the future of work and really go back to, to good jobs, good wages, and good working conditions? Thank you. That's a very important question. And I, you know, I wish there was an easy, magical answer that I can give you. But let me start off on one part of it, and that is guest worker programs. And what we have seen, and there was a study done some years ago by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which describes some guest worker programs as semi-slavery, where people come in and they're totally dependent on their employer. So you come in on a program, you're working for me. And what happens if I cheat you out of your wages? What options do you have? If you stand up and fight back and say, thank you, you're out of here, go back to where you came from, right? So 
what we have to do is make sure that guest workers have legal protections in this country, because right now many of them are being uh, ruthlessly exploited. Okay, that's number one. The second issue is a very profound and important issue which talks about why the middle class in this country is disappearing. And what you have now is a culture on, from the people on top who say, you know what? Hey, in America, I can do anything I want to you. You know what? Hey, I'm making $10 million a year. You know what? We're going to cut your wages. What are you going to do about it? You want to form a union? We will illegally make it impossible for you to form that union. You're a woman. Well, I can pay you maybe 70% of what a male worker gets. What are you going to do about it? Because there are 10 other people out there who want that job. So you've got a culture of greed on there which says that the employer and the people on top can do anything they want. That's what America is supposed to be about. I can exploit you, cut your wages, cut your health care, discriminate against you. That's what this country is all about. I don't believe in that. Okay? So I have spent my entire life fighting on the side of the people from whom I came, that is working people. And we're going to fight for justice, and we're going to tell those employers they're going to have to pay decent wages and decent health care, and they're going to have to protect the rights of workers. They cannot continue that type of exploitation. So what we have got to count on, this is why it's not an easy question. It's a cultural issue, in fact. And we obviously need laws to protect workers. But at the end of the day, what we have got to strive for is a society which understands that it's imperative that all of our people do well. No, we're not going to give tax breaks to billionaires when children in America go hungry. Okay? We are not going to allow employers to refuse or to allow workers to join unions. So to answer your question, as president, I will do everything that I can. That's who I am. That's what I have done for my entire life. Make it easier for workers to form unions, to make sure that employers do not exploit workers. That's what I am. That's what I have done. That's what I will do as president. Buenas tardes, Senator Sanders. Bienvenido a Iowa. Thank Good you. evening, Senator Sanders. Welcome to Iowa. Um, I'm Alejandro Alfaro Santis. I'm a United Methodist pastor, and I serve a Latino congregation here in Des Moines. And while I agree 100% with free college education, public college, with I agree 100% with $15 an hour, with I agree 100% with green energy and taking money out of politics, the reality of the people that are here without documents is that nothing will change in their lives if they still don't have documents. If, we, one, if, if they still don't have documents, yes. they, they could still, you know, we could pass $15 an hour, and I'm hopeful that we do. But if those people don't have documents, that's going to make a difference in their lives. Right. So, and the... I think it's fair to say also that the immigration issue is not just Latinos. We have people from all over the world. Right. And I've always been uh, uncomfortable with the melting pot analogy because I think uh, we don't need to assimilate people. Uh, and we could think better maybe of like a salad uh, analogy, right? So we got people from all different parts of the world, and we have the tomato flavor, the carrot flavor, the lettuce, the cucumber, and all. And people from the different countries... Uh, bring their un own unique gifts, and that's what you know makes this country great, right? So I have two specific questions. What would you do specifically in the first hundred days to bring relief to 11 million people that are living in the shadows right now? And the second question is, how can we help you? Because it is not about electing a person to be president, and then, you know, that's it. We have a divided Congress, and very likely some people will not say, oh, my bad, you know, I haven't been a good Congress person. I'll, I'll change my way now. No, the reality is that's going to change. Yeah. So we need to elect somebody who will vote for the people, but then we need the people to work. So what specifically would you do, and how specifically right. can we help you? Okay, Alejandro, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, what I would do in terms of immigration reform in the first hundred days is work with members in the House and the Senate, do my best to do it in a bipartisan way, to begin the process to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. 
Second of all, if we are meeting resistance, and I hope we don't, but if we meet resistance, I will explore with the Attorney General of the United States all of the options and legal powers available to the President of the United States to protect undocumented people through the use of executive orders. We will build on what Obama has started. Now, your second question is a very, very important question. And if any of you have gone to any of the rallies that I have given, in all of my speeches, what I always say is just what Alejandro has just said. And that is, the truth is, no one person, no president can do it alone. And that's why the title of this campaign is called A Political Revolution. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean, and I'm the only candidate running for president who will tell you this, is above and beyond immigration reform. The fact of the matter is that the powers that be in this country, Wall Street, corporate America, the corporate media, the large campaign donors, are so powerful that if you think electing me president, you can go back to sleep and I'll get it all done, you are dead, dead wrong. All right? So what this campaign is about, and what I say every single day on the campaign trail, yes, obviously, I am here in Iowa working as hard as I can to win the caucus. I am working hard to win the Democratic nomination. I will work hard to win the general election. But I need your help not only here in Iowa for the caucus on February 1st, I will need your help the day after the general election. I can't do it alone. All of the ideas that I have presented to you, these are not radical ideas. These are ideas, in fact, that the vast majority of the American people support. So our job is to put together a political movement of the middle class, of working families, of lower income people, tens of millions of people, to make an offer to Congress that Congress cannot refuse. And that is that if they continue to do the bidding of the billionaire class rather, rather than the working families of this country, they're going to find themselves out of office. So I say one of my important jobs as president is not just fighting for legislation, but helping to put together that kind of movement which will transform America. I believe that very strongly. Uh, can I say a few words now? All right. Those are great questions. Thank you all for your, your questions. Uh, let me say this. When I began this campaign uh, eight and a half months ago, um, People said, you know, well, Bernie Sanders is an interesting guy. His hair is beautiful. <laughs> he dresses like a GQ type guy. Um, what they really said is that Bernie Sanders is going to be a fringe candidate. The idea of a political revolution, who's talking about that? The idea of taking on the billionaire class, who's talking about that? The idea of providing health care to all people, who's talking about that? Taxing the rich, creating millions of jobs. Way out of the mainstream, Bernie Sanders is not going to get any support at all. Well, eight and a half months have come and gone, and some extraordinary things have happened. And what's happened is that we started off at 3% in the polls. Yesterday had a poll with me at 39%. We started off coming to Iowa. Where's Phil from Monty? Phil, you know, Phil and I drove to Iowa. My guess is that 80% of the people in Iowa did not know who I was, let alone what I stood for. Running against perhaps the best-known woman in the United States of America, one of the best-known people in the entire world. Nobody knew who I was. And yet at the end of eight months, what has happened is we have closed the gap in the polls here in Iowa. And I sense real momentum. We are holding meetings all over the state, hundreds of people coming out, 1,000 people coming out, 1,200 people coming out. By the end of this campaign, we'll have had meetings like this, where some 50,000 Iowans will have come out. We have thousands of volunteers all over the state, hundreds of thousands throughout this country. And listen to this. When I began this campaign, all of the experts said, well, you know, Bernie Sanders, 
you're not really serious because you don't have a super PAC. And what I said is, I don't want a super PAC, and I'm the only Democratic candidate who does not have a super PAC. I don't want a super PAC because I don't represent the billionaire class. I don't represent corporate America. I don't want their money. But then they said, well, how are you going to run a strong national campaign when it takes tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars? And what we said is we're going to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to reach out to the middle class and working class of this country and say, if you want change, I think you have a candidate here who will fight for you. And you know what's happened in the last eight and a half months? This is unbelievable. Never in a million years that I would, would I have dreamed it would be possible. As of a few days ago, we have received over two and a half million individual contributions, more individual campaign contributions than any candidate in the history of the United States of America. And here's the amazing, you know, the media talks about guys raising huge sums of money. Jeb Bush, just the other day, got a check for $10 million for his super PAC from some Wall Street guy. $10 million. Bucks. Do you know what our average contribution is? It's around $27. $27. We are running a people-oriented grassroots campaign we don't need the millionaire's money. We don't need corporate America's money. We're not representing their interests. I believe that we have a lot of momentum here in Iowa. I believe that we have an excellent chance to win. And let me tell you something else that my opponent will not tell you. And that is the issue of electability. All of us, I would hope that all of us, and most of us in this room, know the dangers of the Trumps of the world and the other right-wing extremists who are out there. We want to beat them. And my opponent says, well, this is an important issue. She is the person who can win the general election. I respectfully disagree. Go to the website and look at the polling. Look at which candidate is doing better against Donald Trump. Look at the last national poll, and you'll find that Bernie Sanders is beating Trump by 13 points, Hillary Clinton by 7 points. Go to the polls that just came out yesterday in New Hampshire, running against every single Republican candidate. Bernie Sanders does a lot better than Hillary Clinton. That's in New Hampshire. In fact, I beat Trump by 20 points in New Hampshire. So it is not just the polls that show us doing better than Secretary Clinton against Republicans. There's a more important fact. And that is, as everybody who knows anything about politics in this room knows, Republicans win when people are demoralized and don't vote. Republicans won in the midterm election a landslide. And you know why? 63% of the American people didn't vote. 80% of young people didn't vote. 75% of low-income working people did not vote. Anyone who objectively looks at my campaign at our campaign, at Secretary Clinton's campaign, we'll find that the energy and the enthusiasm and the young people and the working people who are getting involved in the campaign are coming in with us. So if we're going to win the White House and retain control over the White House, if we're going to regain the Senate, if we're going to derail in the House, if we're going to win governor's chairs, we need a big voter turnout. We need excitement. We need energy. We need to involve people who often are not involved in the political process. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that our campaign is the campaign that will do that, is the campaign that will defeat right-wing extremism. Thank you all very much.